Welcome to Approximation Algorithms and the lecture on the Primal Duan Method. My name is Rasmus Pei. We'll start today with a recap of linear programming and some intuition. Then we are going to discuss the Primal Duan Method through three case studies, shortest path, feedback, vertex sets and Steiner tree. Linear programming duality can be seen as a way of showing upper bounds on the optimal solution of a linear program. We do this by solving another different optimization problem, which is also an LP. Let's look at an example. We have decision variables x1, x2 confined to the interval 0 to 1, and we have two linear constraints. The objective is to maximize the sum of x1 and x2. What can we say about the optimum solution? So one simple observation is that x1 and x2 are both bounded by 1, so the sum is bounded by 2. Here we have combined two of the constraints into an upper bound on the optimal solution. But there are many ways we can combine constraints. We can take uh, linear combinations of constraints. For example, we can multiply the first constraint by 1 over 7 and the, and the second constraint by uh, 3 over 7 and get two other constraints that, when we add them together, imply that x1 plus x2 is bounded by 5 over 7. Let's look at this graphically. So this is the plane of all the possible values for x1 and x2. And we can draw the, the constraints. So these are the constraints saying that these values are less than 1. And the intersection of these two constraints uh, correspond to the optimum value of, of 2, or the upper bound of 2 that we just discussed. Uh, the next two constraints uh, are drawn like this, and their intersection is, is the point marked in, in yellow here. So this intersection is the place where these two constraints are hold with e equality. And the value of the objective function in this uh, intersection is exactly 5 over 7. So in general, at the optimum, we are going to have a set of tight constraints that hold with equality, and these are going to imply a bound on the maximum value. Let's look at duality in general, and for simplicity we are going to focus on the standard form of, of LPs, where we want to maximize the dot product of a vector c and a decision variable of vector x under a constraint that ax is less than or equal to b. Here we're using matrix notation. Here c and x are n-dimensional vectors. a is an m by n matrix and b is a vector of m constraints. The dual becomes a minimization problem. We want to minimize bt times y, where y are some new variables corresponding to the constraints in the original linear program, under uh, the constraint that a transpose times y is greater than or equal to c. So here b, a and c are as before, and y, the new decision variables, belongs to Rm. These two linear programs are related in, in various ways. We have the weak duality principle, which says that for a feasible x and feasible y with respect to the dual, we always have that uh, the value of the objective function for the primal is bounded by the objective value of the dual. Second, we have the strong duality principle, which says that if both the LP and the dual have a feasible solution, then in particular they have optimal solutions and they have the same value of the objective function, that is c transpose x star equals b transpose y star, where x star and y star are the optimal solutions.
Finally, we have the so-called complementary slackness conditions, which give a sufficient condition on a dual and a primal fe feasible solution to be optimal. The first condition says that if a primal variable is greater than zero, then the corresponding constraint in the dual is, is tight, holds with equality. And symmetrically, if a dual decision variable is positive, then the corresponding primary constraints holds with equality. If those two conditions hold, then the complementary slackness condition says that X and Y are both optimal. We won't be using the complementary slackness conditions directly since we are mostly interested in integer solutions, but we can use the same idea of going back and forth between uh, primal and dual solutions. The typical game plan is to take a primal infeasible X and a dual feasible Y and start improving it in the sense that we find ways of improving the objective value of a dual. This means that we increase some yi such that a constraint becomes tight, corresponding to some decision variable xj. Then we are going to use this as a clue as to how to change the, the primal. So that is, we are going to modify xj. And this process is repeated until we arrive at a feasible x. When analyzing the value of the objective function for the solution that we arrive at in this way, we can use the fact that all the constraints that we applied are tight. Let's make this more concrete by looking at a few examples. We're going to start by looking at a problem that you all know. It's an optimization problem that is actually in polynomial time. So we're going to be aiming for a, an exact solution. So the input is a graph, uh, v, comma, e, and let's say it's undirected. And for each edge, we have a weight, c, e, that is non-negative. There's a designated start vertex, s, um, and we want to output a shortest path tree with root s. So the output is going to look something like this. And for a given node t, we can find the shortest path or a shortest path from s to t by following the edges in the tree that lead from s to t. Dijkstra's algorithm is the most famous algorithm for solving this problem. And it works by gradually growing the shortest path in the tree. So there's some current tree, and we look at possible edges to add to the tree. The one that is chosen by Dijkstra's algorithm is the one that minimizes the path length from S. So that is the edge that leads to the node that is closest to S among all the nodes that have not been explored. We can formulate this uh, problem as an integer program. So let's introduce a decision variable xe that encodes whether an edge e is in the tree. Then we want to minimize the sum of all weights of uh, chosen weights subject to constraints that basically say that we want to connect all vertices. And this is expressed by saying that for every cut s comma v minus s, if we sum over all the edges that cross the cut delta s, uh, the decision variable xe, then it has to be at least one. So at least one edge has to cross the cut. And this is not hard to see that if we constrain xe to be 0 or 1, then this is equivalent to the original shortest path problem. Let us write up the dual linear program. So the primal is here. In the dual linear program, we're going to maximize the sum of decision variables uh, ys, where ys corresponds to uh, the constraint s in the primal program, linear program. Also for each decision variable xe, we are going to have a constraint that says that if we sum up the ys for all the uh, cuts s uh, that where e crosses the cut, then this has to be bounded by ce. So this is the dual LP. So let's, let's look at a step of the primal dual algorithm. So we are going to have selected some set of vertices um, 
making up a tree, F. And there's going to be some nodes, uh, like this one T, that are outside of this tree. So since we don't have a, a spanning tree, some constraints are going to be violated. And in particular, if we look at this tree, which has a vertex at C, if we sum all the decision variables uh, crossing, corresponding to edges crossing this, this cut, uh, they're going to sum up to one, or sorry, zero, which means that the constraint is not satisfied. And we're going to maintain the invariant that this means that the yc, the corresponding decision variables in the dual, is zero. This means that we can increase yc in the dual solution until the sum constraint is, 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 is tight. So let's say that the tight constraints correspond to an edge CE. Then we simply add the edge E to the shortest path tree. Now, it turns out that if you do this, the edge you add is going to be exactly the same as in Dijkstra. So I want you to pause and think and answer the question, why is that? Now we're going to go back to optimization problems. Feedback's vertex set problem is a problem on an undirected graph with weights. And the objective is to remove nodes from the graph. So we have weights on not on the edges, but on the on the nodes. And we want to re remove a subset of the of the nodes and adjacent edges such that when we remove these nodes, the remaining graph is going to be acyclic. And we want to do this in such a way that the sum of the weights of the nodes we remove is, is as small as possible. And weights are non-negative. So we can write this as an integer program. Again, we make a decision variable for each choice we have to make. So xi indicates whether node i is uh, removed or not. So we want to minimize the weighted sum of these xi's. And we have a set of constraints that says that for each cycle, we need to remove at least one node. So the sum of xi over all i in the cycle should be at least one. And if we require xi to be either zero or one, this is equivalent to the feedback versus set problem. Since the primal is a minimization problem, the dual is going to be a maximization problem. So there's a typo here on the slide, where we aim to maximize the sum of the decision variables yc, subject to constraints corresponding to the decision variables in the primal. So for each i, we want the sum of the yc's uh, containing i to be bounded by wi. Both of these linear programs are kind of uh, impractical. One has a huge number of constraints. The other one has a small number of constraints, but each of them has a lot of terms. But these are go just going to be tools for analysis, and we're not ever going to actually construct them. In the primal dual algorithm, we start with x equals to 0 and y equals to 0. So x equals to 0 is not a feasible solution in general if we have any cycles, and y is going to be feasible in the, in the dual. So now we look for a violation of the constraints of the primal. So we are going to look for a cycle uh, where none of the vertices have been selected. And we are going to uh, try to find a particular one, c, that has the smallest number of degree three or more vertices. Okay, so degree one or two, we, we are going to ignore. So that gives us a cycle C. We can find it using breadth first search. And we can, we are going to increase the corresponding dual variable YC until there's some uh, constraint in the dual that becomes tight and holds with equality. So this means that there's going to be some vertex I such that this sum of YC for all cycles uh, C that contain I is going to be equal to WI. So this is a tight constraint in the dual setting. 
and then we are simply going to set x x i equal to to one. So include vertex i in the in the solution, and we're going to repeat this over and over again until there are no cycles left. Okay, and each time we add i, we it's kind of removed from 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 consideration from the from the set of cycles that we that we consider. Okay. So in order to analyze this, we look at the the cost of the solution. So that's just the weighted sum of these x i's. And now we can use the fact that each w i that has x i equal to one is equal to a sum of the dual variables y c for cycles c that contain i. So if we can upper bound this this sum by some factor f times the sum of y c's, then we're going to get an f approximation. So in the next slide, we're going to consider this. So let's start with what we had before. So we can see that each yc appears some number of times, and we can express this in terms of a sum over all the cycles, where we weigh each yc by the number of cycles it appears in. So if s is the set of vertices in the solution, s intersection c is going to give us the number of times that yc appears. So let's, let's look at an example. So suppose the, the graph looks something like this. We're going to have some um, paths in the graph that have only degree two vertices. So for example, up in the, in the top here, we have a bunch of de degree two vertices. And it's clear that once we choose one of these for the, for the primal solution, then we're never going to choose one of another one of these again, because they're never going to be on a, on a cycle again. Okay. On the other hand, for higher degree vertices, it can be the case that, that we choose several vertices on a, on a cycle. But it's always possible to find a cycle that has few of these high degree vertices of degree at least three. So I claim that we can always find a cycle with at most a logarithmic number of these, not counting the degree two vertices. And this can be easily be seen by looking at the BFS tree, where the number of vertices grows exponentially with the depth of the of this of the tree until a cycle is found. So by carefully choosing the cycle C, we can upper bound S intersection C by a logarithmic factor. So we get log n times sum of the yc's, which again is upper bounded by opt. The logarithmic factor is not the best part. In section 14.2 of the book, you can read about a two approximation, also based on a primal dual algorithm. The next example we're going to consider is the so-called Steiner tree problem, which is a generalization of the minimum weight spanning tree problem. Like for minimum weight spanning tree, we have an unweighted, undirected graph. Furthermore, we have a subset of the vertices that we care about connecting. So let's denote this subset by T since these are also called terminal vertices. Okay. So the task is to find a tree that connects all the vertices in T while minimizing the weight. Vertices that are not in T may or may not be in the tree. So in this example, for example, we could choose these three, these three edges perhaps, and we would have a tree that connects all the terminal vertices. We can formulate this problem as an integer program. Again, we make a decision variable for each edge, and we want to minimize the weighted sum of the xe, where we use ce to denote the weight of he. We want to express that all terminal nodes need to be connected, and we can do this similar to what we have seen before in terms of cuts. So we are going to require that the sum of all edges that cross a cut delta s is at least one for all cuts that separate terminal vertices. So that is 
all cuts where that includes some, but not all of the terminals. So let's denote this set of cuts by P. So I'd like you to pause and think. Why is this problem equivalent to the Steiner tree problem? So this is our primal LP, and we can consider a relaxation where we scrap the constraint that x is 0, 1, and instead just require that x is greater than or equal to 0. We could say less than or equal to 1 as well, but it doesn't have any effect on the, on the optimum, since we are minimizing a sum of positive weights. So the dual LP then becomes a maximization problem. Again, all the constraints in the primal have a one in them, so we just maximize the sum of ys, and the, we have we're going to have a dual constraint for each um, variable in the in the primal, saying that the sum of all the cuts that involve a particular edge e. Um, is, must be bounded by the weight of Hg. In the primal dual algorithm, we are going to start with an infeasible primal solution where we have no edges at all. So here we have connected components that have each of the terminal vertices isolated. So let's call these C1, C2, through C2, and so, so forth. And each of them correspond to a constraint that is violated in the LP. Now we are going to increase all of the decision variables corresponding to violated constraints of all, or these violated constraints until there's some constraint that is satisfied with equality. So let's say that this, this constraint corresponds to variable E then we are going to add e, the edge e, to the, to the primal so solution. Okay. And this is always going to be um, contributing or connecting to one of the components. It might even connect two of them. Okay. So this means that this component is, is going to grow, and now we have a new set of, um, of connected components, and we have a new set of primal variables to, to increase. And we go on like this, adding edges that become tight uh, one at a time until we have a, a tree that connects all of the terminal vertices. And this can never con create a cycle because we always add an edge that cross the cut. Finally, we want to remove any dangling edges that don't contribute to the to connecting terminal vertices. To analyze the weight of the tree that we arrive at in this, this way, we again use the equality that CE weight for an added edge is equal to the sum of the ys for all uh, cuts that, is, that are crossed by the edge E. So now the contribution of Ys can be bounded by the number of times that Y, that an edge is in such a cut. We would like to upper bound this by two times the sum of the Ys, which would, which would imply a two approximation. However, it's not true that edges from a particular cut is, are added at most twice to the solution. What is possible is to show the inequality by induction on the size of the tree F. Please see the book for details. In the book, they consider a more general problem called the Sinophores problem, where we have several pairs of vertices S1, T1, S2, T2, and so on, that all needs to be connected pairwise. For the Steiner tree problem, there is a better approximation algorithm known. Now, the best current approximation factor is 
approximately 1.38 or logarithm of 4 by Birke et al.